So the purpose of this exercise is to really try and help us get hold of the principle that when we're looking at building local church, um, the key thing is to let Scripture shape our practice rather than adopt a practice and then try and find it in Scripture. Uh, and I think we can often be influenced by our backgrounds of churchmanship or by current Christian trends, conferences, books, techniques, things that are producing certain uh, fruitfulness in certain areas. We, we can very easily be pulled into a shape that makes us look for uh, things that, that just can produce a result. Whereas what I'm trying to do in this session is help us to think, no, when we build local church, we really need to get right into the heart of New Testament principles and see, well, how did Paul do it? What were the things that were important to Paul, just using his, him as an, and his apostolic ministry as an example? Because the things that mattered to him surely must matter to us. The things that he put weight upon, the things that he gave time to, the things that he commented on, the things that he put in his diary, the things that he left out of his schedule, the things that he decided, no, I'm going to do this, I, I need to do that. So just to let the, the um, narrative, particularly of uh, Romans 15, is, is, is a bit of a narrative mixed with... with um, uh, an epistle, it's in the middle of the epistle, but it's a little bit of a narrative description of what he's doing. And I, I think it's about also recognizing that this isn't just descriptive of what Paul did, it's prescriptive. It's saying there, there was a method, there was a, a set of values, there was a set of um, a, a philosophy of ministry, if you like, that Paul was very, very governed by. And I suppose our contention would be that to get New Testament results, you have to do it in a New Testament way. And so uh, there was a lot of things that came out there that will be, I'll reflect on. Um, I'm not saying everything I'm going to pull out from here is all that's in there, but geez, these are the things that particularly stand out to me. So uh, in verses 1 and 2, I think unity and maturity stand out. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And I think that conveys Paul's heart is to bless all of God's people, whether that is in a local church. His heart is to be a, the, the church is a blessing to one another. Uh, it doesn't have factions or different sort of levels of Christian. Uh, he's saying if, if you're stronger in the Lord, well, bear with those who are a little weaker, help them through, be a blessing, build people up. And when it comes to interchurch relationships, he's, he's arguing, I think, there uh, that we're not arrogant, we're not, uh, um, but we're actually servant-hearted. We want to bless others with what God has blessed with, the particular grace that God has put upon us as a local church or a network of churches? How can we bless others with it? How can we be blessed by the grace that God has given others? So I think even though Paul does speak quite prescriptively when he's giving instructions to the churches that relate to him, he's saying, this is our practice, we don't have other practices, this is how we do it. He's got his own way of building and the things that matter to him. So you can go into a church that Paul is inputting and you'll know what he teaches. You'll know what he practices. There'll be a, um, a sense of the values being the same everywhere. But with that, he's got a real heart to bless the wider body of Christ. He's got a heart for maturity and unity. And I would say in a local church, that's really important that we feel the same way about all of God's church, even though we're building perhaps according to the faith that God has given us. So that's the first thing that just leaps out of the page at me. The second thing, in verses 8 to 12, I think he has a real um, strong view of God's global purposes. So in those verses, he says, he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles. He says, I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to, to the Jewish people, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So he's saying, you know, Christ came 
to the Jews. There was promises in the Old Testament. He wanted to, to confirm those promises. Then he says, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it's written. And then he quotes other promises in the Old Testament. Therefore, I will sing, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. So what Paul is saying there is he's come, uh, obviously from a Jewish background himself, but he's now understanding that Jews and Gentiles together make up this wonderful what he refers to as one new man in Christ. It's like he's saying God's dealings with the Jews were in order that the Gentiles could also come in so that this new tribe, if you like, this new tribe on the earth, this glorious church made up of every nation, every tongue, every tribe that we see a glimpse of in the book of Revelation when John is viewing this scene before the throne of every tongue, tribe, language and nation, And Paul is saying a local church must be built on a vision of God's global purposes. So in some ways, I would have to say the most healthy, the most mature, the most united, the most glorious expression in local church life is multicultural. It is going to express the culture fully of the community that it's in. That would be Paul's longing. He's recognizing uh, that, that God has the nations in his heart, So therefore, we should have the nations in in our heart. The Tower of Babel divided people, divided tribes, divided nations by language. Pentecost reunited them again. So there's something that's on Paul's heart, and uh, he's got in his mind that a local church isn't to be insular. It isn't just to be um, one-dimensional. It's to be very much focused on the reality that Jews and Gentiles together are now inheritors of the promises. There is no longer any dividing wall. We are one new man in Christ. There's a completely new identity. The church is a new tribe, a new nation on the earth. He seems to be very strong that a local church has that in its, in its uh, very, very DNA. Then he goes on, I think, to talk about uh, discipleship, and that came up in some of our feedback. He says in verse 14 and 15, I myself am satisfied about you, brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God. So what is he saying there? Well, I think what he's saying is, When he says, I'm satisfied that you're able to instruct one another, he's saying, this is a local church that now has been planted, it's got a leadership in place, and the the body of the church, the people in the church, have grown in their maturity to such a point that they're able to disciple one another. They're able to uh, instruct one another, they're full of goodness, they're filled with knowledge, So they've got a character that's good, full of goodness. They're filled with knowledge. They know the Bible. They know their doctrine. They're quite well founded. And they're able to look after each other, able to instruct one another. And that obviously is, at the moment, that's very popular in church circles, sort of disciple-making, trying to encourage the church to to very much take on a discipling culture. The one thing that I would just add in here that did come back from uh, Kev's table was that he says, on some points, but on some points, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God. So what he's saying is, you're able to instruct one another, but my role is there's a grace gift God has given me. He's saying, as an apostle to you, as a church, there's a grace God has given to me to be able to bring some instruction that's over and above and into what you would be able to give to yourselves. So I guess he's arguing that uh, no local church has all the answers within itself. And that's one of the reasons why I think networks of churches, relationships between churches, recognizing different grace gifts uh, on men and women to serve into different church situations is really important. 
because he's recognizing, yeah, a church is good when it can look after itself within its own internal discipleship uh, mechanism, but there will be uh, ministries external to that church that can bring the grace that is lacking in that particular situation. So there seems to be an emphasis there on uh, making sure that maturity in the gospel, maturity of discipleship is, is there. And that's important for us to recognize we can't separate conversion from discipleship. You know, it's all part of the same thing. God wants us to keep growing and have a culture in local church life where uh, believers are encouraged to grow, develop all the time. Next, I think um, he, a value to, to Paul, something that really matters to him, is that he's always breaking new ground with the gospel. So in verse 19, he says, um, all the way round, uh, sorry, so from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I've fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. It's, he said in other um, places he wanted to preach where, uh, Christ where he was not known. And in verse 22, he says about often being hindered in being able to reach places he was wanting to go. In some ways, you could say his gospel was, his priority was the spread of the gospel even more than it was care of the churches. He was always wanting to be on uh, to the next uh, missional opportunity. And in verse 23, he says, now there's no longer any room for work in these regions. And since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you passing as I go on to Spain. So he's constantly looking for an extension, uh, mission advance. He's looking to plant churches. He's looking to extend the mission, not just, just consolidate where he is. And I would say that within a local church, that kind of um, vision for expansion, that vision for mission, that vision for church planting, believing that God wants to take us beyond where we are into new things, that's a healthy DNA. That's a healthy thing for us all to have uh, within, our, within our framework, within our, the values of our local, our local church. So he's constantly taking the gospel into new situations. And then linked with that, uh, in verse 18 through to 19, uh, we look at the components of gospel advance as Paul recounts them. So he says there, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring Gentiles to obedience by, notice this, by word and deed. And then verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So what Paul seems to be saying there is he expects the gospel to be, the preaching of the gospel, to have three components to it. This is his reflection. He's saying, I've not spoken about anything other than um, uh, Christ. He's, he's uh, um, taught uh, the word. And he says, by word and deed, he's, uh, there's been deeds that they can look at, the way he lived his life, the way he served the churches. And then is wonders. He's saying that there is powerful signs and wonders, an activity of the Holy Spirit that uh, has also been used to bring fullest gospel impact. And I think what we can learn from this is that words, works, and wonders at times all need to be involved in the proclamation of the gospel. There, all needs, there always needs to be these elements that God will do in different ways at different times to bring gospel impact. Words, teaching the gospel, works, demonstrating the gospel through how we live and how we impact the community, serve the community, and wonders, those breaking in moments of the Spirit of God when God does something utterly extraordinary that cannot be put down to human effort. And Paul seemed to say that he'd, he'd seen all of those three things happen, and that was part of his uh, kind of armory of gospel uh, proclamation. Um, and and uh, yeah, so that's, that's something that he, he seemed to, to emphasize. Then uh, next in verse uh, 25 through to 28, we find here that there seems to be a real heart that he carries for the empowerment of the poor. And again, within a local church situation, uh, it seems to be Paul is emphasizing that, saying, look, I want you to emulate me, I want you to carry the same heart. In verse 25, he says, 
At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, and they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. Now what's notice, what notices to me in this is Paul is obviously his prime calling is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That was his sense of God's call on his life on the Damascus road. That's what God said to him, you know, I'll send you to the Gentiles. You're, there was a clear sense of the call of God on his life to reach the Gentile world, which is an enormous thing. But he shows us that he took time out of his diary. He took time out of that schedule in order to go and deliver aid uh, to help the poor from this offering. It seems to me that he gave attention and uh, time uh, in his life so that working with the poor, empowering the poor, was something he demonstrated. And I would suggest to you that if it's important for Paul, it needs to be important for us. It needs to be something that every local church doesn't just treat as a department, but actually has within its very DNA, a sense of we must remember the poor, we must empower the poor, we've got to give attention, time, budget, um, uh, leadership capacity to make sure that the poor are always uh, right at the heart of what we are doing as a local, as a local church. And then uh, the last thing he mentions, and then we can uh, begin to um, debrief on some of this and think it through, is in verse 24, and I think this is fascinating. He says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, the language he uses there is very friendship-based. He says, I want to see you as I come through to be helped on my journey. So he wants the local church to be involved in sending him to Spain. So I think there's something there about local churches uh, funding uh, and supporting missionary activity. If they're part of uh, networks together where they can impact through mission activity into other areas. He says, I want you to help me. I want you to help me get to Spain, help me make an impact there. We can do more together than we can do on our own. I want to get to Spain, so I'll come and see you so that you can help me get there. But notice this, he says, uh, I want to be helped on my way after I've enjoyed your company for a while. So this is not a visit from headquarters. This is not some sort of uh, visit from, from uh, someone who's ab above them but has no relationship with them. Paul is saying, I value your friendships. I want to enjoy your company. I want to be refreshed. I want us to be mutually refreshed uh, before I, I move on. And I would suggest to us that the local church flourishes best when we really do understand it is a family. It, it's not about hierarchy, it's not about ministry position, it's about family together on a mission. And whether you're, in this case, Paul, the apostle who's overseeing all these churches, or whether you're part of a local church, the idea of enjoying one another's company, refreshing one another, helping each other on the mission together, getting involved in the mission together, is right at the heart of Paul's writings, the way he communicates to the churches. He, he doesn't, there's no sense of a headquarters visit. Paul is amongst friends. He's coming to see friends and he wants to um, help, them, uh, help them as a local church, but also for them to help him and for there to be a sense of mutual refreshing. One of the things that we really want to convey in this network is that whatever situation you're in, uh, a, a family kind of relationship, a friendship, mutual friendship of those you're working with, the networks that God is put, putting you in, is something that really needs to be developed in order for us to be really fruitful in all that God is calling us to do. So those are things that uh, strike me, unity and maturity, 
uh, awareness of God's global purposes, uh, being the vision that captures us, making disciples, uh, but also recognizing that each church, won't, no church will be able to solve all its own issues. It needs sometimes help from outside. Breaking new ground for the gospel, having a constant vision of where are we going to go next? What's God calling us to beyond where we are at the moment? Having that as a, a DNA of the local church making sure that gospel advance is always with words, works, and wonders, that those components will at different times express themselves uh, and that that's actually part of the way the gospel is, is presented. Sometimes signs and wonders open people's hearts to the gospel. Sometimes good deeds and caring for the poor or blessing our community open people's hearts to the gospel. They'll see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. There's sometimes some people's hearts are opened, not through words, but through actions or through supernatural encounter. And sometimes it's that people hear the gospel. There's, there's words that open people's, uh, and then the Holy Spirit opens people's hearts to receive the message. All of those components being in there. Then the empowering of the poor, really important that every local church in some way, shape or form has an expression of serving the poor, empowering the poor. And that lastly, he seems to make a real big point uh, that it is friends together on the journey. It's people uh, who, who don't have a headquarters mentality. We're all in this together. We can do more together than we can on our own.